it hasn't been easy and it's 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 been a reinvention every fucking time and and my 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 feeling towards myself around that has always been just try to be as forgiving with my mistakes as i can be and and learn from them and and then just continue to move forward through the doubt through the the, the lack of um security or being sure about anything and um and 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 just keep looking inside and finding that place where that that is the source Today's Unreasonable Human has lived a multi-dimensional expression of her immense creativity. She was a national gymnastics champion, a performer for Cirque du Soleil, and has gone on to become an extraordinary creator in the dancing, aerial, and spiritual realms. Her name is Bianca Sepeto. Hi, Bianca. Hi, Erica. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you. <laughs> Yeah, too. I think it's really hard for me to not show in my voice when I'm speaking to somebody that is a very good friend of mine. Yeah, <laughs> I've noticed that. That makes sense. It makes, makes sense. sense. I always end up going a little bit higher in my volume. Like I get excited. <laughs> so I'm trying my best not to do that right now, but I can't. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> so we're just going to go with this. Um, it's unreasonable, but it it's is. It's unreasonable, but it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining me on my show. Um, I am really loving having conversations with the humans that I have encountered in this life because, oh, wow, people are incredible. And you know, you're one of those people. So mm -hmm. when I started the show, I was like, I have to speak to Bianca because you've had such an extraordinary life and career. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a career though. So I'd like to get more into this with you and I'd like to start at the beginning of what would become a stellar career as a performing artist. Um, mm -hmm. So can we go right back to the beginning, which for me, I'm thinking it might be your gymnastics, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Well, well thank you so much for having me too, Erica. I have to say it's, mm. it's, you're one of my favorite people in the world to talk to. And I'm just honored to be here and honored to have you in my life. Thank you. Um, so in terms of my career or m my vocation, maybe we can call it. Yes, that's a great <laughs> because name it. Because it definitely feels more, <laughs> more than a career and it's intertwined with my identity and my being and my karma and my past lives and all the, all the things. Mm -hmm. um, I did be Again, um, I began, let me, let me actually wind, you know, back up a little bit before my gymnastic um, career um, and say that as a child, I was really obsessed with learning to fly. <gasps> and I believed in a multidimensional universe and I believed that I could fly. And I, and I believed that there were portals that existed in the world. And all I had to do was be able to access them and I could live in a different dimension or access a different dimension or walk in between the worlds, so to speak. Um, this was something that I, who knows how it came about in my imagination, but it was very strong and very clear for me when I was young. And some of my earliest childhood memories are um, jumping into, you know, I grew up in Southern California and I grew up in the beaches and I was very blessed to have a very strong relationship with the ocean and, and the coast. And I, and one of those portals that was so obvious to me were the tide pools. So I would jump into these pools of water and if it didn't quite work the way I thought it might work in my imagination, then it became a, a system of belief. Like if I just believe enough, if I just have a, you know, if I, if I, if, if I can, I can manifest this other dimension, if I can, can create it in my imagination mm -hmm. and then it can become the reality that I'm physically in. Hmm. Um, and the same thing with flying. It was something I just had to be able to access. It was something that I felt was innate, was something that we could do as human beings, but it was just, I just had to figure it out how to do it. 
Um, so that led to a lot of jumping into dangerous tide pools at times or <laughs> <laughs> and jumping off of lifeguard stations and jumping off of roofs and and it got my parents very concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, so they put me into gymnastics because they felt like as, le as long as she can maybe learn how to fall <laughs> <laughs> and get strong enough. To maybe, and they put me into swim lessons as well, navigate the ocean, and she'll probably survive this, whatever she's going through. <laughs> well, how, how old were you at the time? Um, I was five when they put me in gymnastics. That's so, incredible. But young. Quite yeah. Young. Um, yeah. And before that, I was in dance classes. I just, I connected with music very physically at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so dance felt like a natural a uh, choice for my parents um, to give me a, you know, a, something that I might be interested in doing, um, swimming, and also, do, you know, growing up in the ocean, it was really important to have those just life skills, yeah, um, survival skills, um, and um, and I think, you know, that imprinting at such young age, it just it just became my way of living. I still believe in a multidimensional universe that we have access to. Mm -hmm. um, now I do it differently through art and meditation, um, pranayama techniques. Um, I've done it with psychedelics as mm -hmm. well. It's an, another portal uh, um, to these different dimensions. Um, and and performances always felt like that to me as a way mm -hmm. to access um, the different aspects of self or the different aspects of existence um, and to share it with mm -hmm. other people yeah. and pull them into that suspension of disbelief so that we can live in this different place for a while together. And then how does that then inform the rest of your life? Yeah, it may, it may, it may not. Um, mm -hmm. But if it but if it gets you questioning or it gives you an experience that you walk away from that made you feel something, then that, that's what I feel is successful in terms mm -hmm. of being a performing artist and mm -hmm. choreographer and director. So when when you went into gymnastics, I mean, for you, you were just trying to find other portals and you were just trying to fly. That's what you really wanted to do because you believed that in your heart and your parents yeah. did the logical realistic thing okay let's do something safe let's do gymnastics and then how did that translate for you because you ended up having a really incredible gymnastics career um so how did it relate how did gymnastics feed that for you yeah um thank you for that um uh compliment um i i think i had a natural aptitude for physicality um that was just a coincidence in terms of how that connected to my imagination or mm -hmm. not necessarily a coincidence but the two of those two things brought together it was how karmically i manifested into being a performing artist as opposed to a visual artist or a musician or mm -hmm. or whatever else <clears throat> or a physicist i don't know mm -hmm. but um uh I I was also a very driven child. I I think that there was the aspect of, for example, competition in gymnastics was always a double-edged sword for me because I hated competing. I hated the idea of being pit against somebody else because it felt like in order to win a medal or a position or a, a certain point just you know you know the, the perfect 10 or whatever yeah. um but but it, i i hated that aspect of it it wasn't it doesn't resonate with my spirit because it felt like i would i was a performer in my spirit mm -hmm. but i was also competitive with myself so mm -hmm. i was very driven with um uh towards achieving the best that i could be and and was paired with coaches who um, helped me to achieve, you know, those go those goals that we would set for ourselves. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, when I look at my own 
children or I look at other children that I know now and gosh, we learn so much, don't we, about mm. being parents, about our own childhoods um, mm. and our perspectives of the world back then and our perspectives of the world now and through the eyes of children that we come into contact with. But it was a double-edged sword for me because I, 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 I love that I loved being pushed beyond what I think I thought I, I thought I could achieve or imagined I could achieve, and and I didn't like being pitted against other other girls, women, mm. girls, mm. um, specifically in my sport, who I would rather be friends with, mm. and not and not and collaborative with. Mm. Um, there was a short period in my career as a gymnast where I was I did something called group routine. It's it's and I was a rhythmic gymnast, by the way, for your listeners who don't know. Um, rhythmic gymnastics gymnastics is a sport that is under the umbre- Olympic sport that is under mm-hmm. the umbrella of the United States Gymnastics Federation or the Gym- gymnastic federate the International Gymnastics Federation. Mm-hmm. Um, and within underneath that umbrella, there is rhythmic gymnastics, which was my sport with the ribbon and the ball and the hoop and the clubs and the rope. Oh. And, <laughs> and then yeah. there is. <laughs> and then there is artistic gymnastics, which mm. is the bars and the beam and the tumbling. Um, and then there is men's gymnastics and there is acro. Um, mm. And and so these are all different sports, um, but they're all under the umbrella of what we call gymnastics. So my sport was specifically was rhythmic gymnastics. And um, yeah, and it's true. I mean, I did. I was a five-time national champion. I competed for all over the world for the United States. I won my first national championships when I was eight years old. Um, and I did, and 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 so I did have success in that. But one of my favorite, you know, slivers of career in that was was when I was in the group number. And the mm-hmm. group number was six um, six gymnasts who were competing together in one routine. <sighs> And it was so fun and creative and expressive. Mm-hmm. And it was something where we could just figure out how to do all this cool shit together and, mm-hmm. and then perform it in front of people. But of course the performance, what could have been thought of, what, what felt like it could have been performance was always under the sort of, um, you know, sort of for me at least, the you know it, it felt like a bit of a, the oppressive structure of competition yeah. where we we were being criticized and judged for every single movement every single flick of the wrist every single mm. movement of the foot every single they all everything was graded by a point system mm. and um talk about being put under a microscope and then that happening as a young girl going through puberty yeah and that is a recipe for therapy later in life. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. But it's interesting because it was probably the seed because, you know, you had, I can totally see why you were a rhythmic gymnast because it's so creative and it's just such a beautiful um, leg of, of gymnastics. It was my favorite. It's always been my favorite to watch because it is. Oh, so crea- it. Yeah. It's just so creative and mm. so beautiful. And so I can understand how you could really transport your body into this other sort of dimension and other world mm. through your rhythmic gymnastics. But then I also see how it's almost like that seed was planted when you did that group, that group number, there was the yes. seed that was planted of the possibilities that later took you into your career. Right. Yes. 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 It, it did. And I think, I think I had these, um, you know, one of the things that I was, I was really driven to always be the best I could be on a personal level, but I think the seeds that you say, as you say, um, that were planted was a huge part of what kept me in the sport. Just Mm -hmm. the, that feeling of, of freedom, Mm -hmm. um, when you hone an instrument to such a degree that you can get as close as you can to exp- pure expression. Mm. And that, that instrument was my body. Um, just as any dancer as yourself would, t- would, would understands. Yeah. But I think also you, there's something in you though, that is so, it's almost, there's something, I, and I believe we all have it in us. It's just that, what is it that, that, takes like what is it that differentiates people from each other because you Mm. took it upon yourself you wanted to be homeschooled you took it upon yourself to take this 
this gymnastics career that you had very seriously. You didn't, your parents didn't decide that for you. You decided it for you. So what mm -hmm. is the thing that you think differentiates you from people who are like, well, oh, I'm just going to dance after school. And, you know, what was that? Was it just? Yeah. Um, I'll be totally honest. I don't know, mm. but um, I can't, I can't put a, a, you know, a finger on it exactly. Um, uh, a lot, uh, you know, I was, I was highly driven. Mm. Um, I was the same in school. I mean, I was, I was a, one of those students who had like a 4.2 or whatever. I don't even remember grade point mm. average. Mm. Um, and even though for, um, there was a, um, there was a period in high school where I did home study and, um, and actually most of my high school, I was in home study or some variation on home study, plus a little bit of, uh, a little bit of going into school. Um, I was, I, 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 those, that feeling of achieving a goal always felt very, um, I took it very seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but also it felt, it felt natural. It just felt a part of mm. who I was. Um, and, and, and there were a few times where my parents, because, you know, the, there, there were, there were glamorous times as a gymnast traveling all over the world, interviews, um, being on television, um, magazines and the press and, um, you know, what, what it might be, you know, considered glamorous, um, you know, going to different countries and, um, competing for the U.S., representing the U.S., and and you know being asked for autographs and whatnot. And mm -hmm. sure, there's definitely the this idea of the glamour of that, but the day to day is really not that. The day to day is working really, really hard. Yeah. And I and and I wouldn't want that for my children, for example. Mm -hmm. Like unless they really wanted it, I I wouldn't. I, I I kind of I wouldn't want that for my kids, but cool. but my parents did ask me a few times if this is really what I wanted to do, and I just wanted to keep going deeper and deeper. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Like when you have yeah. a, have a calling, it's like it's a calling in you. It's something that you it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make yeah. sense to other people, and for you now, you look back and you think, oh my, God, I would never do this to my kids. But yet, when you were in it. It was something you had to do. Yeah, and in a way, it it felt. I mean, of course, I had a choice, but it didn't even really totally feel like that. It just felt like a vocation, mm. like like a like a part of my path. That it was really clear that that was my path that I was on, and th this there's not really a rationale or a logic behind it. Like if I if I try to tear that up, like like try to pull that mm. apart and 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 dissect it and and study it none of the pieces make sense, mm. like why I would, because it was also, you know, a lot of it as, as glamorous as it was, it was highly toxic. That mm. environment was, I mean, you see now it's more, it's, you, we see more because of all the, you know, more recent press that's been out of that and the expose, the exposing of, of the abuses of the gymnastic um, um, sport um the, the machine that is competitive and elite competitive gymnastics um i was a part of that that was mm. that was my childhood that was my upbringing and it was something at the time that was endured because it was something that led towards my goal and that that sort of imprinting of enduring abuse Mm. What reflected later on in my career as a performing artist, mm. because as we see, for example, through the Me Too movement, there's a lot of stuff that women have to go through mm. in, 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 in any in most career, any career, really. But as a performing artist, where there's so much emphasis on your appearance and how you look and your body and mm. and what you have on or don't have on. Um, there's also a lot of, there's a lot of men who take advantage of that. And uh, so yeah. like the navigating that as a woman, I think I did a lot of growing in my, as I, as I kind of 
transitioned from a, being a gymnast and athlete into being an artist, that, that transition was exceptionally important for me. And it was like Inanna, yeah. you know, descending into the underworld. It, it was definitely a Persephone thing where I, I had to go down and find myself, the truth of myself, and come back up and bring, to bring that in, into the world because... It, in order to be an athlete at that level, you're doing a lot of bearing, a bearing of emotions, bearing of, of your, of, of your feelings of, mm. there's a lot that you have to be able to disassociate or put aside mm. in order to endure, to, to en endure 10 hours of, of practice. Yeah. And so let's talk about that. Let, yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's get into where, that transition so how old were you when you finished your gymnastics career and started moving into other so i was 16 17 when i transitioned out of the sport um and um and so i, I did my senior year of high school in at in high school so i went mm. back to to high school for that senior year and i com felt completely like an alien because i think <laughs> i had like one or two friends and they were you know, the freaks at the school. And, and I yeah. went to a Catholic school and I had since I'd gone to religious school since I was in third, fourth grade, fourth mm -hmm. grade. Um, and, and so that was the other system that I was growing up in that was a little bit oppressive mm -hmm. was the Catholic church. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'm obviously joking to being sarcastic when I say a little bit oppressive, but um <laughs> <laughs> So, so, you know, all those things together were kind of like a pressure cooker for me. And it was like the, like the coal being compressed, 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 compressed. And I knew there was a diamond in there, mm. but it was deep. It was really deep. And I had, I had to dig pretty deep to find that. And it was during my senior year that I kind of did a lot of experimentation with boundaries, with who I am and, and identity. If I'm not a rhythmic gymnast, who the fuck am I? Yeah, like my whole identity was around being this sort of, you know, this world class athlete and mm -hmm. um, Olympic level athlete. So who am I if I'm not that? And that yeah. was that was a major, major transition for me. I did have the support of some mentors, which I feel so grateful for. Um, and um one of them, um, her name is Michelle Berube, and she was a dancer with Michael Jackson um, and um, among uh, um, many other wonderful, she had uh, um, um, artists and she, um, this was pre, we, everything we know about Michael Jackson, obviously mm -hmm. uh, now. Um, and he was still, you, you know, he at that time was at the top of the height of the pop world. Um, and, um, uh, so she had been, she had been a rhythmic gymnast and she sort of pulled me aside and took me under her wing and said, look at this world that exists outside of competition mm. and you are an, this incredible instrument and I have these opportunities where you can let the instrument shine. And mm. so I really credit her with just, you know, that, that awakening into the rest of the world, that, uh, that, uh, that next dimension of mm. existence. Mm. Um, and, uh, and the opportunities that she afforded me, we were doing, um, uh, one of the first things that she brought me into was a, it was, it was, it was my first gig with the circus and I was 16 mm. and, um, she, there was called the LA circus and it was a local circus that sort of traveled around and we would pitch up a tent on the weekends in different parks all around Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And we had one, like a single point where we could hang a trapeze. And, um, and that's where I met a lot of uh, some clowns that, um, and aerial acrobats and contortionists. And we had a rhythmic gymnastic number. We were a, a quartet mm -hmm. and um, we dressed all in white and we had this beautiful, um, you know, she picked athletes who were fresh out of um, sport and she also was recently retired. So, mm. um, but she was just our, a generation above us. So she had had all this experience. She was probably in the time in her early twenties, but she felt, you know, like 
so experienced <laughs> to me. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Uh, um, and she, so she, we did gigs at the LA Circus, and she also, um, at the time in Los Angeles, you know, it was LA, so there were opportunities, um, and there was a um, a nightclub that Prince was opening called Glam mm -hmm. Slam, and it was downtown, and so we we performed on the weekends at Glam Slam. Um, uh, and there was a like sort of choreographer's balls where different choreographers from Los Angeles would come in and he would come in and, and we would do these performances of all different kinds of dance. And that was a, another crazy world opener for me just to see all the different styles. So mm. then we had our circus gigs and we had our glam slam gigs. And um, and then I got a job with this with SeaWorld. Um, and that was through Valerie Condos, who is a very beloved um a uh, coach at UCLA mm. still is um and uh that led to um Valerie gave my name um to Cirque du Soleil Cirque du Soleil also knew about me because of they they keep tabs basically on the elite gymnasts um and different sports <clears throat> mm. especially you know uh, back then, I know they did. I'm sure they probably still do. Um, and so I was in college at the time that I got contacted by Cirque. Mm -hmm. And I um, I was studying comparative religion, and I, which has always fascinated me um, and still does. Mm -hmm. And is now a big part of my work as well. Um, and uh, I was coming home from a woman in Buddhism class and i had an, a, a, a message on my answering machine back in the days of answering machines <laughs> <laughs> um from Cirque du Soleil asking if i wanted to come to montreal tomorrow wow I was like oh my god tomorrow well how about next week <laughs> <laughs> montreal montreal and, so, and that was your first so were you already doing silks then or did silks happen while you were with Cirque du Soleil yeah, so silks, as we know them now, did not exist back then. Mm -hmm. um, I I had learned in, in my stints at SeaWorld over the summers, there was um, some aerial acrobats in that um, show. And they asked me if I wanted to learn a cordelise, or actually, they never called it cordelise. They called it Spanish web. Cordelise is what Cirque du Soleil calls it, is in the French word. Hmm. Um, uh, but they call it Spanish web in the States and in the um, English world. And basically, it's a rope that you climb up and you stick your hand or your foot in a loop and you get spun around. Um, hmm. and, um, and so I learned how to do it then. And, mm -hmm. and that was even more attractive to Cirque because they were looking for somebody who could be in what they call house troupe. So house troupe is where you, you kind of had multiple jobs within the show. We were kind of like the backbone of the show where we were always in the show and taking cues and mm -hmm. had a couple of members. Um, and um, and, and they, they were looking for somebody for that and also for their skipping rope number. And I was a rope specialist because of all my experience as a rhythmic gymnast. So mm -hmm. I did a solo with my rope in, um, in the show. And then they, because I had some experience with Spanish web, that also made the, me attractive to them. And, mm -hmm. and basically the next week after that phone call, they, they invited me up to Montreal. I, I, I went to Montreal with a suitcase thinking I was just going to be there for a week to kind of see if it was right fit for me, for them to see if it was right fit for them. And I never left. I stayed, well, I oh. didn't leave for a few years. Um, I did mm. eventually leave, but for a few, I, I went on tour. I wound up going on tour, taking a contract with them and going on tour and had friends box up my stuff in, in Amherst College, which was where I was studying comparative religion. And um, that, was, that it. was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were with them for how many years, Cirque du Soleil? With that production of Kidam, it was over three years, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of three and a half years or so. Hmm. And I think, what was the, so you were studying comparative religion and then the Sukta Salaic thing came up and obviously there was, there was a no, no brainer. You were just yeah. doing it. It was not even a question that you were going to go and do that. Did it, you? Well it, well, it wasn't, but, but it became so once I was there. Uh, yeah. Okay. It was another dimension that opened up. And once I saw what that world was, I was like, I knew my soul mm. said, this is your yeah. vocation. 
Yeah, anyway, and you, I didn't mean to and I think no, and I think it's important to to realize like this Cirque du Soleil is grueling, right? Can you explain the process of putting together a show Cirque du Soleil? Because yeah, well, I can explain what it was like back then because that was yeah, my back experience, then. but. But basically, there was a whole year of creation before the show premiered. And then there was a sort of, um, there was like a sort of softer premiere, and then there was a bigger premiere later. Um, and the softer, it was considered to be sort of a softer premiere when we were in Montreal. And then the sort of bigger, and we had a few months between Montreal, Quebec City, and Toronto. And then when we came to the States, that was considered our U.S. premiere. And they made the majority of their money in um, in the U.S. So that's mm. why that was considered like a, like a second premiere. And mm. it was, um, and back then, the sh um, you know, we, we premiered in Santa Monica. And mm. that's, we stayed there for a while. I mean, we came back twice. Uh, we came back and, you know, so we, we were there twice. It was just a really popular thing in Santa Monica. And it was a homecoming for me. And mm -hmm. it felt really good to to be able to know that my hometown and my part of, you know, corner of the planet that I grew up in had such love, reverence and support for that mm -hmm. company and for a yeah. company that I was in mm -hmm. and to be received by family and friends in the ocean mm -hmm. because we were performing on the ocean um they're right on right on the pier in on um, Santa Monica itself um like a true um merging of dimensions the merging of worlds mm -hmm. yeah and how many hours how many hours a day were you practicing when you when you were rehearsing well, so so yeah so we did the full a year of creation and that 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 was pretty incredible um I'll, i can i can get into to that a little bit but the um we were training um from nine to five that was mm -hmm. a normal training day um and then but because i kind of arrived a little late to the project and they also had um hired me to do to perform in something that i was not an expert in i was i was an expert with with rope but they mm. asked me if i wanted to also um do the uh, the cordelis routine the the act the um rope right. rope act um and um and so i said yes I, i'll try it and but i i at the time i couldn't do a, a pull-up it's not a <laughs> skill that you had to develop as a rhythmic gymnast um so i would everybody would go home, I would have dinner, and then I'd train again from six to 10. Yeah. So it was nine, nine to five training and then six to 10. And I was I was actually used to that kind of training. That was very similar to um, the kind of hours I put in as a gymnast, which was um, our, our, our practices began at six in the morning um, in, as a gymnast. And then I wasn't done with my work day until 10 p.m. So 6 a.m. Yeah. to 10 p.m. every day. Um, and in between in between trainings, I would fit in school yeah i mean it just shows though that that if you want to do something really unreasonable or something completely unique if you have something that you want to achieve a lot of the times you know it's not just luck it's talent but it's also the amount of hard work that you have to do sometimes to get to that point you know it's not mm -hmm. not in everything in life but in this specifically and many times with performing artists the amount of work that you have to put in before the the show is yeah. it's pretty insane you know it is and i think that you know it's it's that's always been my experience and that's mm. how i understand performance is mm. is you know the the performance itself is the tip of the iceberg mm. and and underneath that you have the hours and hours and hours and lifetime mm. of training and yeah. experience and um you know as my daughter's one of my daughters puts it she says the performance is the reward yeah. for all the hard work <laughs> so true i love that yeah. i love that yeah it's true and so now you've been with Cirque du Soleil for many years what uh -huh. did you then move into after Cirque du Soleil so i followed my heart mm. the, the the tour um the tour uh, was moving on to Europe and they wanted me to renew my contract and I was definitely um, interested in that mm -hmm. but I had fallen in love mm -hmm. and the man that I had fallen in love with um, had moved to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and so I was called once again back to my motherland 
mm. and um and and came back here and moved to um we moved into a home together in Topanga Canyon mm-hmm. um and um and I'm glad we did because we're still together and have kids and mm. and uh have built uh, our our own little you know world together here yeah you've built a beautiful world together by the way um so you are still a performer to this day like you've still yeah. uh, you've done some incredible things i know a few years ago you did the opening show for the burning man oh yes yeah for the the first ritual um yes. that we did a performance um uh with the man um and um we actually uh we actually had the um the man give birth so it was uh just a a way to question inquire around push against mm-hmm. um redefine boundary around gender mm-hmm. and and with this iconic figure of a uh, of that looks that it is called a man and does look like the depiction of a man that we see on every door of every bathroom in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But for burners, those are the people who go to Burning Man, has always been talked about or often been talked about and thought about as not necessarily gendered. Mm-hmm. but also uh, clearly gendered. So it was, um, and this was um, the inception of this idea um, came from Melissa Barron, who I call Sin, that's her playa name. Um, and um, and she approached me about this, this concept and it was a, a collaboration between she and Larry Harvey, who is the founder of Burning Man. Um, and um, And she asked me if I would um, be involved in the project, and I wound up um, writing, directing, and choreographing a production based on um, the art of the sculpture and the art of um, uh, the sculptural pieces around the the inside of the, what was, at that time was the Temple of the Man. Yeah, it was beautiful. The video is just phenomenal. I oh, remember watching you. it. It's so beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of choreography. I just love how you brought in the your aerial art skills, you know, because they look just gorgeous. The red. Thank you. Thank remember you. The red, yeah. yeah, that the the, the blood. Mm-hmm. The and 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 then the pooling of the blood out from underneath the man as the man gave birth out into the, the rest of the playa, which felt like we were it was the sort of the DNA that was being spread out into mm. the next generations of of playas, mm. you know, that would come to come. Um, once again, that sort of idea of multidimensionality and time being cyclical and not linear and, you know, the same sort of like touching down of what happens in that land every year um, mm-hmm. and how what we did then affects ripples out to the past of what was done there and the in the future of what will be done there and that is all really happening all in the same moment mm. but um yeah it was it was the hardest production probably i've ever done it was just so crazy complicated to try to put on a production of that level in the middle of the desert with no communication <laughs> yeah i can imagine <laughs> i mean talking about unreasonable it was like it was probably one of the most unreasonable things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and somehow, and even up until the show, like all the tech failed and I'm there <laughs> and I wasn't even supposed to perform. And one of the dancers had to get air vac out cause she got really sick. And oh. so here I am, hadn't slept for 48 hours and, and, and was like, okay, well, I guess I'm doing her part. And, you know, got into the costume and got wrapped up into the sculptures that we created um that that are was the the beginning of the piece and the stage direct, direct the stage manager came up to me and said we have no sound uh. <laughs> and he said what do you want to do <laughs> should we cancel the show and i said we are doing this fucking show no matter what <laughs> yeah yeah and you did it and, and and soon after 
somebody came in who understood the issue, fixed the issue, we had sound and we did it. And it worked beautifully. It was a true gift giving birth. So I think the thing that I love is that you started, you know, the creativity, that multidimensional way of thinking, this, this intense creativity that you've always had, you've taken it through this, this, these grueling careers as a gymnast and then in Cirque du Soleil, more creative, but still very grueling, but you've, you've, as you've evolved as a human being, your creativity has just expanded. And I think, you know, there's this thing about people believing that, oh, I'm a gymnast and then my career is over or I'm a dancer and I'm going to just, there's always like a time limit to performing artists, especially dancers and um, aerial artists and that. And you have really like, you just are not even, um, you're not giving into that idea at all because you, what I've seen you do in your careers, you are just growing and you're, you're taking everything that you've learned, all the wisdom that you've learned, all the experience, and you're just growing into something even bigger. And so what is it that um, you feel has made you not give in to that like belief that you've got a timestamp, you've got a time limit? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not really sure again, hmm. but um, I, it, it, I think it comes back to that idea of drive and vacation. Um, and, and it's that it's been very tempting for me many times over, you know, my, you know, through the decades to, um, to say, okay, I'm done with this, but it never feels right. It, it hmm. never feels like I'm, it's myself, it, you know, there's always, some impulse to create even during COVID and how devastating that was for the performing arts and continues to be, um, you know, I, I, I channeled that into a, um, a different um, form of creativity and I created a series called Lunar Yoga, which was, mm -hmm. is a um, uh, online uh, sort of embodiment experience where I, 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 relate to the moon cycles and 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 how the, the moon is in relation to our planet and the other planets basically you know based on astrology and um and how the reflection of that imprints onto our personal experiences of life but in an embodied way mm -hmm. so i'll and i'll look at um mythology art music um uh and um and philosophy yogic philosophy and we'll do sort of a lot of chatting about that and presentation around that and then and then pull those and and tarot and then pull, which is which is very much about archetype and symbology and um and, and history and whatnot and art um and then pull that into an embodied experience through the body and mm -hmm. and it, it's in the frame and context of yoga um but me being who i am as an artist and also as an athlete, I pull a lot of artistic references in and a lot of references from um, all of the physical therapy <laughs> I've had mm -hmm. to do um, mm -hmm. and, and maintenance that I've had to do to keep my body in in a shape that can still perform aerial acrobatics at my age um, mm -hmm. and um, and continue to express itself. Um, and, you know, it's all evolution. I mean, I feel I get really pissed off with, with ageism and I mm -hmm. and and I and I think it's I think it's bullshit. I think I, I, I think that one of my favorite people to watch on stage would be a dancer who is in their 70s or 80s. I just think yeah. there's it's such an informed body. There's so much experience in there. Mm -hmm. And it's really about a deeper listening as an audience member to to be able to see the layers and layers of 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 story within those movements that mm -hmm. frankly a 20 year old doesn't have. I, I mean certainly somebody in their early 20s or mid 20s or early 30s or whatever they they it's not like they have nothing to say of course everybody has something to say and we all are, are expressing who we are in that moment and that is the kaleidoscope of being an artist and how wonderful it is but it doesn't mean it has to stop when i get to a certain yeah. age and 
And um, and it, for me, it always just has felt like it's the right choice to continue. And right now, for example, I'm doing a lot of work with a ballet company that I started working with in 2008. Um, it's called Luminario Ballet. And I've created quite a few pieces for this company. We have a gala coming up in um, uh, October this year at the Avalon, um, October 22nd at oh, the nice. Avalon. And um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm using the resources from my career to to sort of funnel into the acts that I'm going to be choreographing for this number. I mean, for this particular production, and it is a fundraiser, mm -hmm. so it's it it feels like one of those things where you have that combination of giving towards something that you believe in and love with your heart. Um, and at the same time, creating art. And that merging has always felt really, really important to me, that mm -hmm. idea of service and art. Um, you know, those two things together are, I think, um, sort of golden, golden. Mm. So do you um, see yourself, do you see yourself performing for as long as you can? I mean, and you're obviously going to choreograph until literally the day you die, but actually performing do, do you see yourself doing that until your body says no there's already i think it's all about um um it's it's, it's again like that i'm going to reference this uh the 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 metaphor of, of of being like a kaleidoscope you know it's like it's there are certain things i can't do now that i used to do in my early 20s and certain things that I can't, couldn't do in my early twenties that I can do now. Mm. And, and I just find that really compelling to, mm. to see artists personally. I mean, if Me other too. people find it compelling, I hope so. But uh, I personally find it really compelling to see over the tra trajectory of an artist's career and musicians too. Like, you know, I love to see, for example, one of my favorite artists is Tori Amos. And I love to see what she did with Little Earthquakes Mm -hmm. um back in the 90s and i love to see what she's doing now i went to go see her at the greek and i just feel like wow wow she could never have done that in the yes. 90s absolutely you know? i agree i agree there's just something about somebody growing into who they are as a performer as an, an artist and it does take time and it takes that the experiences that you've but you can hear it. You can hear it in the voices. You, like when somebody's singing, you can hear it when somebody's performing. There is something very different about their way they move their body. And even if yeah. they can't do the things, certain uh, technical things, the way they do the other things are just this. Yes. Something so embodied about it. And it's like only oh. years and years and years of life can really bring that out of you. Yes. So I do. I, I, I really hope that that this whole ageism thing is starting to fall away because I think there was a time when it was such a thing, but now I think it is starting to fall away. I think that people are really realizing the value of somebody who has experience, which is something yeah. you cannot have without the years, you know? Yeah. So let's hope that's what it is, but, um, let's hope I, that's what it is. Yeah. But, um, I, I think we have, run out of time even though i'd love no. to speak to you any further <laughs> i just um want to say that i love how your life trajectory has been completely up to you you've made you have really really set yourself on your path and you've done it with a lot of grit a lot of the time you know it takes a lot to be at the level that you have been in your life um and I've just learned so much from you as an artist. You know, when I once worked with you and saw how you've just got this amazing organic way of, of creating, you know, that's something that cannot be taught. That is something mm. that's really, you were really born with. And it's just been beautiful to watch, mm. um, to watch you as an artist. And I can't wait to see what, what you do next. I really can't wait to see how it all evolves. Oh, Devin, thank you. And that it makes me feel a little shy, but I thank you for those <laughs> words. Yeah. Um, but I do, I also want to say too, for especially any artists who are listening, there has been a lot of doubt and there has been a lot of, you know, a lot of unknown. And, mm -hmm. and there's that place of thinking, uh, what am I doing? Why am I still doing this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want anybody to walk away from this conversation 
who might, you know, be an artist or be in a similar place that I've been and, and, and think, oh, wow, well, that, I guess it must be nice for her. But because really, <laughs> mm -hmm. it hasn't been easy. And it, it, it's been a reinvention every fucking time. And, and my, my, my feeling towards myself around that has always been just try to be as forgiving with my mistakes as I can be and and learn from them and and then just continue to move forward through the doubt through mm. the, the the lack of um security or being sure about anything and um and and and, and just keep looking inside and finding that place where that that is the source mm. um that we can only find when we really when we do that looking deeply inside yeah into those I love that. inner dimension Thank you. I love that. Okay. I'm going to finish off our conversation with my three unreasonable questions. Um, sure. Bianca, what is the most courageous thing you have ever done? <laughs> the most courageous. Mm. Oh, that's a tough one, Erica. Um, I think it's, it's, I think it's, that. It, you know, if I, if I can just say that it's, it's, it's that, it, every time going out and putting myself out there into with something new and not knowing how it will land in a new, for an audience, mm -hmm. whether that audience is um, a yoga class that, that I'm leading um, or, a, or a, an aerial class that I'm leading or whether it is um, a performance, you know, in, in, on a televised performance, mm. you know, it's just that, that constantly stepping into the unknown I think um, that's that's what courage is, has been in my career. Mm, I love that. Thank you. Okay, my second question: Who is your or one of your favorite unreasonable humans, and why? Hmm. Well, I want to say you. No, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can list all the reasons. <laughs> um, so, oh gosh, there are some. There's so many that come into mind. Mm. Um, mm. I feel like my husband is really an unreasonable per person, and <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of spouses would think that way, but I also mean that in the way that you mean it. Yeah. Um, like sort of the risk taking or stepping into the unknown is at least that's how I interpret unreasonable how you mean it. Um, this is a man that has inspired me, um, an artist who has inspired me quite, you know, literally on such a personal level um, over so many years um, uh, as somebody who um, takes such risk to follow his his heart, mm -hmm. regardless of what anybody else might think or what um, you know, might be the reasonable thing to do. And mm. so, yeah, Robin, Robin Singh, my husband. Mm. Love that. Okay, my last question. You touched on it. What is your definition of an unreasonable human? Yes, that is a good question. Um, I think an unreasonable human um, in this context is, is somebody who is willing to do something and follow their heart and follow their calling and do the work of first of all looking inside to figure out what that is because sometimes that's the hardest thing mm -hmm. and maybe that's what it is and it, i mean maybe that's the that is the seed of of the unreasonable unreasonable human mm -hmm. is somebody who is willing to quiet the noise of of the world of expectation around oneself and and find that voice that is unique to oneself and then use that voice mm, i love that yes <laughs> yes yeah, yes to all of it thank yes. you bianca thank you so much i've loved oh, this, this conversation been, this has been so fun thank you so much for having me i this love you awesome to be here it's been really fun thank you Thank you. I, I love, love you. you. I'll see you soon. You. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. 
Well, that's it for today's episode of Unreasonable Humans. Thanks so much for joining me. Please follow the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. And remember that a great rating goes a very long way to support the show. Until the next one. Bye.